if you if we right now want to just get a base level assessment of our health, um, what tests are we supposed to get? If you if I came to see you or if someone came to see you and you want to just understand where they were and they said, I feel fine. I don't know what's going on, really. What are the basic tests that a 50, a 60, a 70 year old person should be getting what, what, that you would like to see us all get to, to to get a base level of what's going on with us? What are the most important tests if we were on next week in a go get tests? Um, so from a, a so I, I want to caution the listeners about this. You know, there's a lot of programs out there. There's concierge programs and executive health programs and these trucks that go around in 18 wheelers and they can do all these things for 200 bucks or whatever. You really first get what you pay for. So be careful of those. Second is this is a very individualized discussion that needs to occur with someone who understands prevention um, and cardiovascular disease with a patient. And so what I would say is, of course, age appropriate um, cancer screening makes sense. And the evidence out there would support that as do the professional societies. You know, in my book, uh, every patient that I take care of, especially as a new patient, um, will typically have an EKG. Uh, and most of them will have basic blood work, a blood chemistry, a blood count, thyroid. And then I do a lipid panel, which checks lipoprotein A. As you may know, one in five people worldwide has this. Each lipoprotein A particle is five times more atherogenic than LDL. So it's a very potent risk factor and it's associated with early heart disease and valvular disease. And uh, it's 90% genetic. So it's important that people know about it. Uh, regardless, that's what I usually start with. And then depending on what patient's symptoms are, we may talk about doing a calcium score or even a CT angiogram or what their risk factors are. And it's a very individualized discussion that there needs to be a pro-con discussion with the provider. I think anyone who gets up here and says, oh, you should do these 20 tests um, is probably not being a judicious steward of resources. Thank you. I echo Dr. Freeman. I'm not big on tests, but that's also my discipline is very focused on breast. So I'm not routinely ordering blood work. However, for cancer screening, for sure, I have something to say about that. So pap smears should start at age 21 and continue every three years until about 65. And then you can um, space it out to be every five years and or just depending on your circumstances, make a change in the frequency. Colonoscopy needs to begin at age 45. And if you're clean as a whistle, you can do it every 10 years um, until 75 and then individualize it. Mammograms, super controversial, especially in our um, current audience, I'm sure, because we're very focused on health and, and wellness. And we know that there's some serious drawbacks to radiation and mammograms and some other issues. However, it is still our gold standard in screening. And even the USPSTF changed their recommendations from 50 to 40, like a soft call on 40 uh, to begin mammography. Uh, different societies have different recommendations, but if you're wanting like the, you know, platinum level care here, we're talking annual mammograms. So every year between 40 and forever until you are pretty sure you're going to die in the next five years from something else that's going on. And then you get to stop. If you have dense breasts, I always add whole breast screening ultrasound to the annual regimen, usually spaced six months apart from the mammogram. So I'm doing an imaging on the breast twice a year. If you are also then at elevated risk, perhaps because of a strong family history, maybe you carry a gene mutation or you yourself have had a cancer, breast cancer that mammogram missed, then we call that occult, mammo occult cancer. And these are all good indications for doing a breast MRI that has some serious downsides, including injection of a heavy metal called gadolinium. So I don't use that willy nilly. It's um, very strategically planned for given women. And it might be every year for the highest, highest risk people. But usually I default to something more like every three years um, if they're high enough for us to even need one at all. Blood work, I think. If someone's already going for blood work, like with their medical oncologist, I'll just throw my two cents out there and be like, hey, why don't you check? And I'll have a look at it. Um, your vitamin D. So that's always in the cancer patients routinely checked. You need it between 40 and 80 nanograms per milliliter um, to be in an optimal breast cancer reducing level. 
people with low calcium have been ele at elevated breast cancer risk and same with B12 and especially my plant-based eaters, then you probably know that we need to think about supplementing and we need to do more than think about it. We need to supplement with B12 um, and potentially EPA, DHA supplements um, and D and vitamin D. So if that's low, we got to get it up to 40 to 80. And that can sometimes take some serious um, supplementation doses, like 10,000 milligrams. Right. There's a, a cancer test called, I think, Galleria that tests for like 50 cancers from your blood. Do you recommend that? Mm -hmm. So Gallery um, is a, a pretty cool, interesting new test. It was developed specifically to detect high risk tumors that are generally diagnosed too late. So stages four for sure, uh, but you know, three and four advanced stage cancers include a top 12 for them. Things like um, pancreatic, ovarian, lung, colorectal, um, and a handful of others. And so the sensitivity, the ability of this gallery test to pick up early stage one and two cancers, like, wow, that's life transforming because usually these cancers that I've mentioned really require some symptoms that already suggest advanced stage and more than likely too late. Ovarian and pancreatic are notorious for that, right? So this test was designed to like, hey, let's pick these fatal cancers up at stages one and two, and now everybody's got a fight and like good fight and chance against dying from them. Um, and so their ability to pick up these more aggressive cancers at stages one and two can be like 50 to 80% of these early stages that they'll find. In contrast, breast cancer, stage one found in 11% of all the stage ones that they screen that's not helpful to me or to my patients that's missing way too much, but it was designed that way on purpose. So long answer is I use gallery very selectively, usually in gene mutation carriers who then are at high risk for specifically ovarian pancreatic and, and some others, um, cancers that are hard to screen otherwise. So be smart about it. It's never covered by insurance and runs about $900. And it's a snapshot in time. So it's not like a one and done and you're never going to get ovarian cancer. It's you don't have it now that we can detect. And you should probably check again in a year. So it's expensive. Thank you. Um, so just to, to be clear, what is your actual prevention protocol? If someone said to you, okay, just... Give me what exactly I should do. Um, we've talked about it a little, but what is your five, 10 step plan of what you are saying that every one of us for the rest of our lives should ideally do to increase the chances of us staying healthy and avoiding heart disease, cancer, and other illnesses? Um, I don't know. I'll go first. I'll piggyback yeah. on anything yeah, else. Sorry, go ahead. You go, Christy. No, no, I was saying you go first and I'll piggyback on heart, you know, heart disease outranks breast cancer. So you go first. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, remember that um, all the things that you've heard us talk about are the same recipe for prevention, right? So it's, it's really eating a predominantly low fat, whole food, plant-based diet. It's regular exercise. Obviously check with your doctor first to make sure that's okay. So that's 30 minutes of breathlessness a day that we're looking for um, in most cases uh, every day, if you can. Uh, third is stress relief, some form of mindfulness meditation or stress relief. Fourth is sleeping enough. We're always looking for about seven to 10 hours a night of uninterrupted sleep. And if that's a problem, see your doctor. Um, it is connectedness. So the people of the most love and support in their lives truly have the best outcomes. So I highly recommend that. So we talked about diet, exercise, stress, sleep, and connection. And then the last part of course, course is to avoid substances. And that includes, um, tobacco, air pollution, marijuana, which is a very big thing here in Denver, um, and uh, other forms of substances. So other uh, street drugs and even alcohol. So if you can do all of those things, the likelihood of disease becomes much less, but it is not zero. Mm, yep, definitely. Uh, you get an A plus on that list. Um, to it, I might add... Um, so, so, well, with stress reduction, exercise is a great way, but meditation is very helpful. Uh, gentle stretching, Tai Chi, forgiveness, like we've talked about, is, is great. Fasting. So it's not just eating well. It also uh, has to do with examining when you don't eat. So intermittent fasting, um, there's been a lot of very recent literature suggesting that skipping breakfast elevates cardiovascular risk and early mortality. 
but that doesn't mean you still can't get a minimum window of 13 hours of not eating. Um, some studies specifically with breast cancer show that 13 hours um, or, or more, so more is better. So up to 16 hours of not eating. So your fasting window is 13 to 16 hours. Those women have a 36% drop in breast cancer recurrence at five years post-diagnosis as compared to women who have a shorter fasting window than 13 hours. So intermittent fasting is very useful. The makers of Prolon, some of you, most of you may know what that is. Um, it's uh, developed out of USC, uh, University of Southern California, Walter Longo's lab in the Center for Longevity. It's been studying um, pathways of aging and what ages you are these protein dr uh, driven pathways like mTOR and PKA and what accelerates aging is also going to accelerate killing you. So it includes things like cancer and heart attacks and stroke and diabetes. And the two major ways to slow down that pathway to aging are to eat a plant-based diet. Honestly, you should have turned this entire podcast off uh, if that weren't one of the answers, because we've all been big proponents of plant-based eating or summit, I should say. And um, the other one is eating it all. So now we're back to fasting and it turns out you really rev up autophagy, auto cell phage eat. So the cell scavenging mechanism of like, hey, who's damaged and deranged and senescent and just buzzing around spewing out inflammatory markers all day long because you are not doing this body favors and you have to go. A good night's sleep does not get you into autophagy. It uh, Fasting overnight and pushing it to be an OMAD one meal a day person and you're fasting like 23 hours a day, uh, that doesn't get you into autophagy. You need to not eat for about 72 hours. And what Longo's lab identified was that people aren't going to drink water for five days. So they developed with $30 million from NIH, a food box of food. It's kind of ridiculous to pay like 200 plus dollars to not eat, but it's like this box of five days worth of food, or you could do it uh, supervised perhaps um, on your own. A DIY plan for Prolon is all over the internet. I don't know. I don't know. I just get worried if I do a DIY, I'm going to just have just too many carbs or a bit of protein, too many nuts in that one bite and boom, out comes insulin and destroys my five day fast. Even I just pay the money and do the prolon. Um, they just actually had a point. I started by saying they just published uh, data that showed if you do this prolon five day fast, three months in a row, five days each month, you will reverse your biological age by 2.5 years. That's pretty fantastic. Um, so if you are not underweight, I think that's something pretty cool to investigate doing. Um, but beyond that, I think you should do these prolonged fasts about three times a year. So every four months. So I would add fasting to our lifespan, health span plan. Great. Thank you. Dr. Freeman, do you want to answer that same question about what your exact protocol would be? I, th I think I, start, I started the conversation. So oh, okay, you started. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, that's okay. I don't think I would add any any more. <laughs> okay. Now, what about um? We talk about avoiding animal products, but what about fat from whole food plant sources such as raw nuts, raw seeds, avocados, and olives? And then specifically, what about saturated fats in nuts like macadamia nuts, or maybe cashews or Brazil nuts that have more because a lot of times people use the term saturated fat as bad, and even the word fat is bad. But what about when they're from nuts, seeds, avocados, and olives, and specifically high saturated fat nuts like cashew Brazil nuts and macadamia nuts? Is that a concern? You know, interestingly, there's actually a, a study out there that showed like something like one Brazil nut a week actually can lower cholesterol, interestingly enough. So I think the way plants produce fats in the matrix of the plant itself doesn't need, seem to be nearly as harmful as what we get from animals. But that said, all of those foods are highly caloric and should be limited. And that includes the oil forms of these things. So for instance, tropical oils like coconut, which are very high in saturated fats, even higher than lard, uh, are actually not recommended by any of the professional societies uh, for their risks of uh, 
coronary disease and other things. So in general, I usually recommend that these things be used sparingly. Uh, I always joke that the worst thing that ever got invented was shelled pistachio nuts because they kind of, they're really easy to just take big handfuls and eat them up and the shells are designed to really slow you down. Um, so I think if people can figure out how to um, eat these things in moderation, it's great. Now, you know, a lot of people will call them, especially in the plant-based world, this sort of gateway drug, right? Where first you eat a nut here, then you have nut butters, then you have nut bars, you have all these things. And before long, you're eating all these high calorie foods. And it's very possible to do that. So remember that the human body really enjoys a, a fatty sort of sweet taste, which many of these nuts provide. Uh, and so they really do need to be used in moderation. Thank you. Um, if you could access any five data points, including results from any medical test, detailed information on individuals' diet or exercise habits, level of any mineral or vitamin, cholesterol levels, blood sugar levels, salt intake, which would you choose as the most crucial to predict which among a group of 1,040-year-olds are likely to maintain good health until 95 years old? Want me to take that one too? So, you know, we know that as we go through life, what we do early in life matters a lot. In fact, even what we do in utero, which is not really our choosing, matters a lot. So, in general, um, you know, there's the you may have heard of these life simple seven or simple eight, depending on which year you look at the AHA. But people who follow those habits as a lifelong venture do better. And so we also know that people who are thinner and maintain a healthy body weight do better longer too. So in general, if you said to me, you know, pick the 40 year old out of the crowd that might live the longest, I'd probably be wrong to tell you the truth because none of us are that good. But that said, it'd probably be the person who's not smoking, not drinking, exercising regularly, eating plants, um, you know, maintains good relationships with people, uh, has a healthy way of dealing with stress, um, and maybe doesn't come from a family where everybody died early uh, for some reason or another. And then hopefully, you know, they have the best genetic lot and the best environmental lot, which will carry them all the way through. Great, thank you. Dr. Funk, do you wanna to try to answer that one too? Sure, I think um, if I were to just look at some tests, um, I think Dr. Freeman, you would agree, what of all the cholesterol panels, et cetera, et cetera, do you think a lipoprotein A would be the most important? If you just had one cardiac indicator on a blood test, what would you say? I'm not sure I could, I, you know, it's hard for me to say that there's just one, you know, lipoprotein A is, is a very potent risk factor, but so is blood pressure, for instance, and smoking. Um, so, you know, I, there's so many that we could choose from. And I think, you know, sometimes uh, there is some data out there suggesting that even if you have a high lipoprotein A, that if you live in a better environment, the risks may not be as high in the all comer. It's very limited evidence. I wouldn't hang my hat on it, but it's interesting. Um, but that said, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, you could also get a calcium score on these 40 year olds. And if anyone has calcium at 40, which some people do, you could argue that their longevity is probably less, at least actuarially speaking. Um, so. Yeah, I think it, that'd be a good one. We'll do a calcium. We'll, we'll take that we'll do a calcium uh, score and a hemoglobin A1C, right? We want to weed out the pre-diabetics and intervene early and get them back to being insulin sensitive. The younger, the better. I think as Dr. Freeman was implying, just a straight up body mass index calculation would give us a strong indication if this person is, um, their their body composition gives us an indication of future mortality. And if you could one up on that and do one of these like sort of body MRIs that give you the volumetrics of your um where your fat distribution is and whether it's white fat, brown fat, and if it's subcutaneous or intra-abdominal. So nestling around your organs, that intra-abdominal fat is directly associated with early mortality. So body mass index is a very poor man's way of getting that data. So if I could have whatever I wanted, I would get